afternoon, everybody, and welcome. My name is Wolfgang uh, Reinecke. I'm the Dean of the School of Public Policy here at CEU, and it gives me a great pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's event entitled Drugs. It's about health and not policing. This is not only a timely and complicated issue, but an issue that has vexed policymakers for decades, and it's an area certainly that the School of Public Policy <laughs> hopes to focus on as it's building up its policy research and teaching portfolio. And we here at the School of Public Policy are very fortunate to have the Open Society Foundations as such a committed partner. And let me highlight in particular the role of the Global Drugs Policy Program, which has worked tirelessly to shift the paradigm of drug policies away from the war on drugs a putative approach to one based on public health and human rights considerations. This is the first in a series of three debates, which equally prominent panelists to be continued in early 2013. The next discussion will focus on the international drug control system, and the last and third debate will consider drugs and development. And so without further ado, let me welcome George Soros, CEU's founder, who has kindly agreed to say a few opening words. George Soros, as you know, does not need any introduction here, except to say that like on so many other issues critical to public policy, George Soros has been on the forefront of the campaign for global drug policies based on health and human rights. And it's with gratitude that we welcome you here, George, in the midst of this afternoon. And the floor is yours. Thank you very much for coming. Very good. So uh, there are uh, some uh, pr problems that actually are insoluble. And then this, the search for a solution tends to make the problem worse. Uh, drug, uh, the drug problem is one of these. Actually, death is a, um, an even more fundamental uh, issue. Which, which, uh, to which this uh, 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 consideration applies. But this is, uh, uh, this is, this is easier because there is no way out. Well, uh, it, they are actually similar. The, the, the death and the drug policy in that sense are, so, so there is no solution. Um, uh, and as I say, the, the remedy uh, can make the, the, or the solution uh, can make the problem uh, worse. Um, and that applies to uh, the war on drugs. Uh, so I don't know what the solution is. Maybe uh, there is a solution and I'm wrong. Uh, but uh, 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 I, uh, one thing that I'm pretty convinced about, that the war on drugs has created additional problems uh, which are very severe and, and uh, have done a great deal of harm. So uh, we need to find some other way to deal with the drug problem. When I talk about the drug problem, I don't just mean drug addiction, although there is a problem of, of addiction which is uh, 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 something that you can't get rid of. In other words, uh, you can uh, manage to uh, help some addicts to break their addiction, but the tendency for people to get addicted to uh, some substances, whether it's uh, uh, drugs or alcohol, is uh, also, in that sense, an insoluble problem. But it's also a, so a social problem in the sense of how does uh, uh, society deal with uh, uh, drug addiction. And that is the, the drug problem that I consider insoluble. Uh, um, but certainly, uh, treating it as a public health problem, I think, uh, is preferable to uh, the, the, the war on drugs. So I don't, as I say, I don't, we don't have a, as a foundation, we don't offer a solution, 
but we are looking for alternative ways which will do less harm uh, to uh, than the current policy. And so uh, in, uh, it's in that context that I think the CEU studying the problem can be also very helpful to the foundation in understanding what can be done and what can't be done and what are the consequences of following one policy rather than another. And therefore, I'm very pleased that the CEU has taken up this issue and is going to uh, study it. So I welcome this. Uh... Thank you very much. very much, George, for laying out the ground here. You put the bar very high. Uh, uh, probably no solution, but certainly we need to look for alternatives. And it's now my pleasure to hand over the floor to Balaj Denesh, uh, who is the moderator of tonight's debate. Uh, Balaj, as many of you know, is the executive director of the Hungarian Civil Liberties Union, which has, since its establishment in 1994, become a leading NGO in the field of drug policy reform and advocacy in Hungary. And so thank you very much, Balaj, for joining us and for agreeing to moderate this panel. Welcome. Thank you very much, Volon. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome again. And the, uh an overall panel discussion uh, of the CEU School of Public Policy uh, and the Global Drug Policy Program. Tonight, we will try to divert some attention to the burning issues, burning and surrounding issues of, uh, of drugs. And uh, I say surrounding because uh, for ages and ages, years and years, members of academia, uh, human rights organizations, <coughs> and human rights activists uh, public health professionals and just ordinary citizens who use their common sense when talking and thinking about uh, drugs and drug policy are challenging the current system uh, of, of drug prohibition and still yet the system is alive and seems to be very hard to change at this, uh, this point. And I say burning because uh, as a human rights activist I am fully aware that the issue of drugs and drug policies is a human rights uh, issue. I see no other field where the gap between good practices and evidence-based approaches and real-life practices and policies are bigger uh, than on this field. Uh, I see no other field where fear, prejudice, <coughs> and moralization are driving the policies which are causing much more harm uh, uh, than good. And I see no other field when our uh, choice of weapons, I mean, after all, we are talking about uh, a war, cause more harm and unintended consequences uh, than uh, their original uh, uh, goals. Uh, and uh, their goals, uh, I'm, I'm, we are talking about tools about which a long time ago was proved that they are actually unable uh, to achieve uh, uh, their, their goals. Our panel tonight, <coughs> set up the goal to, uh, to examine how and why this is possible. Uh, what are the ways out of this lose-lose uh, trap, what is called uh, the war on drugs? Uh, and if you like, the questions we will talk about are uh, as simple uh, as it is. Uh, do we need uh, to use the public health approach and policing, or do we need to use the public health approach for uh, uh, policing? What are the alternatives to the, uh, to the current uh, approaches of the global war on drugs? Everything is given uh, to us uh, to be able to uh, <clears throat> learn the most about this issue, thanks to the organizers. We have uh, uh, three very sophisticated, experienced, and inspiring speakers uh, tonight. So let me first introduce you, Kasia Malinovka Sampruk, who is the head of the uh, Global Drug Policy Program at the Open Society uh, Foundations. Uh, Kasha used to be uh, serving on the uh, WHO, the World Health uh, Organization Strategic and Technical Advisory uh, Committee on HIV AIDS. She has been a member of uh, the UN Reference Group on HIV AIDS Prevention and, and Care Among Injecting Drug Users and was a member of the uh, Technical Review Panel at the uh, Global Fund. Prior to joining the Open Society Foundations, uh, where she was hired to be the head of the International uh, 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 harm reduction development program. She used to work 
uh, at the UNDP HIV <coughs> unit in New York and in her native uh, Holland. And she was a co-author of uh, Poland's first national uh, AIDS, AIDS program. Uh, besides her uh, extensive practical experience, she's now a doctoral candidate at the Columbia University's uh, School of uh, Public Health. Uh, we have a second speaker tonight, uh, Michel D. Kadachkin, uh, who is now serving at the Global Commission on Drug Policy and serving as the UN Special Envoy for HIV in Eastern Europe and Central Asia. Uh, between 2007 and 2012, uh, he served as the Executive Director of Global Fund uh, to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis and Malaria. He has spent the last 25 years, uh, I believe, fighting AIDS as a leading physician, researcher, academist, activist, policymaker, and uh, diplomat. His involvement with HIV began in 1983, and by 1985, <clears throat> he started uh, to run a clinic, the clinic which today uh, treats more than 1,600 people uh, with HIV. Uh, formerly a professor of immunology at the uh, University of uh, Hollande Descartes, Descartes. Uh, he has authored and, and co-authored more than 500 articles on the issue of HIV. And last but not least, let me introduce you our, our third speaker, who is uh, Roger Fleury, uh, who is now a police liaison officer uh, uh, of Switzerland uh, to Poland, to Hungary, to the Czech and Slovak Republic. He is a former police officer, an active, uh, uh, he was an active uh, police officer. Uh, he used to work with the Swiss Federal Criminal Police. Uh, his specialization was drug markets and drug-related uh, crime. Uh, his job was, and that's uh, very interesting from our point, uh, to combine and link police work to uh, social work, public health policies, and science. Uh, and at the same time, he remained part of uh, policy investigations <coughs> for combating trafficking groups. So if someone, then he is able uh, to, uh, to present us the law enforcement side uh, of, this, uh, of this story. Uh, so let me start to uh, pose a maybe strangely sounding question to uh, all of you. Let's assume that uh, in this room, except the three of you, everyone belongs to a group of alien social scientists, right? So we are coming from planet Mars. Curiosity hasn't discovered our base yet, but we are living there <coughs> and we are doing our job. A while ago, we were sent to planet Earth to uh, research this planet's policies and practices uh, around mind-altering substances. In, in the last weeks and months, we read every possible article. We met a lot of scientists and, and, and researchers, but we simply don't get a thing. We just simply don't understand how something, as a policy, which caused more harm than good, is still uh, in effect. How is it possible, I know it's a difficult question, uh, that in this planet, uh, some drugs which clearly cause more harm than others uh, are legal, and states, different governments of, of this planet uh, get tremendous funding through taxation from the commerce uh, of them, and some other drugs uh, which are much, much less uh, uh, dangerous, which has some medical potential, uh, are illegal. Uh, let's put the question... Uh, as simple as it is. How is it possible, <clears throat> if you have an answer to that, that alcohol, which let's say legal for 80% of the uh, population of, the, of this planet, and which is uh, uh, accountable for so many accidents, uh, has linked to violent crime, and cause so many death and addiction, is legal. And cannabis, uh, which is much less dangerous, uh, at the same time is illegal, and we are ready to put users of cannabis uh, into prison. So what would be your short answer uh, to, to us as social scientists to this? Okay, so, so let me start. Welcome to Earth. <laughs> Um, I think the first, uh, the first thing that you should know about Earth is that we're not very logical and we're not very rational. Uh, we make a lot of decisions that are based on fear, prejudice. Uh, we are uh, 
some advices depending on what part of the world you live in. So, for example, there's a country which sets the uh, tone of discussions, which is called the United States of America, uh, where uh, around 50 years ago, the president decided that cannabis is a deadly and dangerous drug. He's done so for political reasons and basically uh, began a campaign to tell Americans that cannabis uh, is um, socially harmful. Uh, it was easy for him to do that because it was mostly ethnic minorities um, that were associated with cannabis use. Um, so as you can see, those decisions were not based on science. Um, this is how uh, some of the story began, um, but it basically continued throughout the Western Hemisphere. Um, but I think what's really important for you to keep in mind is that we're not rational uh, and that our policy making is often not evidence driven. And that's not the only example of uh, a policy um, that just would be very difficult, uh, if not impossible, to understand for, for you coming from wherever, uh, whatever planet you, you came from. So whenever uh, you deal with issues that are hugely complex from a cultural, societal, um, multi-stakeholder perspective, um, policies are unfortunately very often not based on evidence. But I hope that as you traveled to Earth, you also got to see the evidence. So um, I understand your questioning. I hope that this questioning is, questioning is, is uh, actually extremely acute because the evidence that the war on drugs has failed is so strong. The health impact that we'll be discussing today has been devastating. The use of drugs has not decreased. Decreased, it has actually increased. Um, and it has led to an epi what I would call an epidemic of incarceration. We will be discussing this. And a huge waste of money. So uh, I see no logic. I don't, but I see no logic in many of the policies that, that deal with such complex issues. But I hope that you have really uh, seen the, the evidence and Tonight, I suppose, we, all of us will be discussing that evidence. It's, a, it's quite a difficult question, in fact. I think uh, it has to be stressed that fear is a very powerful factor, and I understand the fear, the fears of parents, uh, because they're afraid their children might, might pick up drug use of politicians, because they're afraid that Substance abuse could be a widespread uh, aspect of living. And I think this, this big fear of a loss of control led uh, to this international system of drug control which is now in place. And it can be debated uh, whether it's, it's useful, whether it's working. I think for me one of the most important aspects is that in the beginning, it was maybe set out to work fine. It went after an easy solution to create a drug-free society, but it didn't work. In fact, it produced a lot of unwanted consequences uh, under which we all suffer. Thank you. Let's, let's uh, talk about these consequences. Michel, uh, you're very often using the term that uh, the drug war, the global drug war, is actually fueling the HIV epidemic. And you also use a term which is called willful blindness when talking about the drug users and marginalized populations. What do you mean <coughs> on that? Yeah, well, let, let me first set the scene and give a few figures. Um, one out of three new infections with HIV that is occurring worldwide outside Sub-Saharan Africa is um, associated with injecting drug use. There's an estimated number of maybe 16 million people or so injecting drugs worldwide. Out of these, one in five is infected with HIV. And if you look at certain parts of Asia, or not far from here, in Eastern Europe, in 
more Eastern Europe and, and Central Asia, and particularly in the Russian Federation and Ukraine, new infection, uh, people who use drugs account for 60% or, or even more of the new infections. Um, the UN released the new figures um, the day before yesterday, on Tuesday, uh, the, the so-called global report on HIV AIDS, you know, that everyone would know that comes a week before World AIDS Day. And in that report, um, it's, it is clearly apparent that the epidemic is improving in most parts of the world, but in that particular region, the epidemic which is largely driven by injecting drug use uh, and now gaining in sexual partners of drug users is, is increasing. So there is, a, there, there is a huge issue there, a health issue, and why I'm say, talking about winning for uh, blindness, it is because we know that that epidemic can be prevented. We actually know that with uh, what, what is called harm reduction, which is a set of interventions. It's not just one intervention, it's a set of interventions. It is providing clean needles and syringes. It is providing substitute therapy for people who um, w would need it. It is uh, informing people. It is associating people who use drugs in the decision-making process. Um, harm reduction is actually a hugely effective mean to decrease transmission of HIV. Uh, and that has been shown throughout the world, including in those countries. There's a very recent uh, paper on, 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 on Ukraine. So I, I just can't understand how people ignore the evidence. And, and that can only be somehow um, on purpose to serve their own ideological way of conducting the policies. That, that's what I mean. The UN has a goal. The uh, UN's General Assembly set up a goal to reduce new HIV transmissions by 50% in the next three years. <clears throat> Do you think it's possible to achieve this goal without a serious shift of paradigm? It's not, uh, because as Michelle said, uh, this is where HIV epidemic, I mean, injecting drug users are where the HIV epidemic is not only uh, not improving, but uh, deepening uh, continuously. And I think what's really frustrating, and, and um, let me share some of my experience, is, you know, if you work with people who focus on HIV prevention among, uh, through sexual transmission, it's actually difficult and frustrating. Because I, I've done this a lot in my younger days, where we had conversations with young people about why they should use condoms, or why they should, you know, abstain if possible. And in reality, people look at you and say, whatever, and go on with their lives. I have never met a drug user who would say to me, whatever, when I tried to say, well, here are clean needles and syringes. The reality is that we have two sort of interventions. One of them, which is extremely complicated around sexual health of human beings, and another one which is simple, and where, which, where everyone wants it. I've never met a drug user who would say, I don't want a clean needle and syringe. And so having a population that is willing to access your services, knowing how to make those services available, and those services not being expensive, it is somewhat insane that we, in 2012, have a situation where HIV among drug users continues to spread. Michelle, you said you simply don't get why people don't understand and don't get the evidence. Do you remember, and this is a question to all of you, when you did get the evidence? Do you remember the day or the time when you realized that something is not working here? Yes. Um, and, and I think, you know, as an AIDS physician, I, I do remember very well. Actually, I would like to draw a parallel with the early days of AIDS, where I was seeing, you know, basically every patient slowly deteriorating and then eventually dying. And then in 1996, uh, here came triple combination therapy. And within uh, just six months to one year, 
the whole face of AIDS in, you know, in the environment where I was uh, in, in, in the Western country where treatment was accessible, uh, the face of AIDS just changed. Um, three, four years later, I really started working, uh, doing international work and public health or AIDS international work. And that's where I started traveling for the first time to Eastern Europe, particularly, but also to some, to Thailand, to Cambodia, uh, and countries where um, the, the epidemic was severely, uh, was severe and driven by drug use. And I saw the contrast in my own country, uh, which is not the very best example. You know, Switzerland is, uh, we'll discuss that later, and, uh, you know, is, is a, a, a bit higher on the scale, I would say. But in my own country, there's just from 90, from the end of the 90s, and, and of course throughout the 2000s, as harm reduction was implemented, there were just no more new infections among drug users. It is now somewhere less than 2% of new infections uh, occurring are in people who use drugs. You travel to these countries, you realize that, as, as I was just saying, it's over 60%. Whereas the evidence is, is not only there, but it's, it's the most compelling evidence we have in HIV about any mean of prevention of transmission. So it is the shock of contrast, which to me is as powerful as the shock that I had when I saw the change that the drugs can bring. So then I don't understand why these drugs are not accessible to the world, and I don't understand why these, post these interventions are not accessible to the world. I think it's important to add that from a law enforcement perspective, there is no reason whatsoever to object to needle and syringe distribution. I mean, the evidence which was gathered in many European countries is quite clear that uh, distributing clean needles that does not lead to an increase. It's one of the arguments that you hear over and over again, but it's quite clearly. Uh, although, for example, in Switzerland we distribute needles and syringes, it did not lead to an increased use. Uh, also, and I think that's more important uh, for me to say as a police officer, is that um, it makes a difference <clears throat> whether you have to make a body search on a person who is maybe addict, but apart from, from this, healthy, and also maybe had a shower in the last two or three days, uh, or to have to carry out body searches on persons who are uh, ill in, in many ways and living under very bad social and hygienic circumstances. <coughs> it does make a change to police work. See, talking about Switzerland, we are not only talking about distribution of needles. Uh, let's, let's be clear about it. We are talking about heroin assisted treatment, which means people who are seriously addicted to heroin can get heroin prescriptions from the state. How and why the Swiss police officers and law enforcement are supportive of this? I mean, every single police officer joins the Swiss national police is in favor of drug policy reform. Or, or, or how does this look like? I think the majority of police are supporting the current uh, policy uh, in Switzerland, which includes uh, heroin assisted treatment, but above all, a, a broad coverage with opioid maintenance therapy. And also a policy that um, allows for injection rooms where drug users go, consume the drugs, and it's tolerated inside this room, and then they leave the premises again. So this is widely accepted by the police because it brought along many changes which are very favorable to public safety. Um, you know, I, I think this is, uh, we had this solution for a very specific problem. It's uh, opiate dependency and it worked very well in this area. With, with uh, opiate addicts, uh, you don't have a flexibility of demand. These people will go back to the streets looking for drugs uh, no matter what you do against it, you can police them, you can arrest them, you can send them to prison, it won't have an effect on them because they are addicts. And um, we just found that taking the core group out of the black market, out of the streets, it was a big relief to public safety. It, it changed a lot. And also, I think I have to admit that 
police, they cannot stop everybody from using drugs. It's just not possible. There is just not enough of us around to prevent people from using. But at least what we can influence with our work is where drugs are used. Are they used everywhere, scattered all over the streets? Are they used near schools? Are they used in public spaces? Or are they used in a very confined, separate space where it's tolerated? And I think that's something that we did. We used public drug use to a confined space out of the view of the general public. And this generated a big support. Thank you. Question. Well, when did, I, when did I think that it's a failure? Well, I went to college in the United States and to graduate school. And my first AIDS job, um, other than uh, my internship with pediatric AIDS, has been the American Red Cross. So basically, I've learned to do HIV education, mostly focusing on sexual transmission. Um, and then, so it happened that I began a job at the UN, and an opportunity came that I could go home. You know, for someone who left the US at 18, finished college, I mean, f uh, left Poland at 18, finished college in the United States, an opportunity to go back home with the UN was like a dream come true. It was really a very exciting uh, moment for me. And so I went back with all of this knowledge from New York City, where gay men were getting infected, where American Red Cross education was going to school, talking to kids about condom use and so on and so on. And I went back home to Warsaw and I started to look at the data. And it was all people who were uh, drug using. None of my knowledge was that relevant, frankly speaking at that time in Poland, uh, 15, 16 years ago, because it was all injecting drug use. So I had to learn and relearn about HIV and think about what interventions make sense in that context, because what I had to offer was utterly irrelevant. And I think the part that's really frustrating to me is that you know when you think about Russia, we talked about Russia, Michelle, uh, what's, what's frustrating is that we know, it, it, Former Soviet Union, it's almost like a train coming. And we all saw that train coming. And we all knew how to stop it. And we couldn't. And so, so I think that's sort of the frustration. And now the question is, you know, can we turn it somehow to make sure that the damage and the harm is not as extensive as it could still be? You talked about over a million people infected. You know, if we do nothing, it's going to be over 2 million and 3 million. This is going to keep moving. It's not as though, uh, you know, this is going to stop anytime soon. So that's why I think it's important that we make every effort to shift the discussion. The, the figure it was um, 200,000 uh, 10 years ago. It is 1.4 million today, HIV infection. So that's just for everyone to get a sense of the rate of increase of the epidemic. Seems we got the uh, unintended consequences for the seeing the uh, human rights costs, the uh, public health consequences, HIV. But what about the uh, sunny side? Is there, is there a sunny side of the uh, war on drugs? I mean, uh, after all, there is a reason why governments of planet Earth are pursuing this policy. <coughs> That were original goals, you know, and eliminating drugs, eliminating drug use. Where are we regarding regarding this? I think I mean we, we have, have to admit that um, there are some effects. I mean, there is an overall effect of deterrence. Maybe many people who would use drugs are not using it because they're afraid, or they're using it in other places and uh, where there is a risk of police patrolling. Uh, also, there is some effect uh, on the availability of drugs. Uh, drugs are not available virtually everywhere, but I think people who are interested in drugs are able to find it in a very short time. So, I mean, there is an effect of, of law enforcement. And um, I would also say that no matter which direction you take drug policy wise, you, uh, law enforcement remains a very valuable instrument to drug policy. Um, 
I mentioned before the, the injection rooms in Switzerland and it was not so easy uh, to convince users to go to these rooms to use drugs. Uh, actually, we had to establish um, a lot of police patrols around those centers to make sure that they actually move there to use and they don't use in the open public anymore. So, I, what I want to say is that law enforcement does produce a result and it's very useful also in a very progressive drug policy as we have in Switzerland. But I'm afraid um, if you calculate all the effects we had with this purely prohibitive approach to the drug problem, we have huge impacts on the public health side and also interesting for me as a law in, in enforcement officer again, you have a big effect, a negative and unwanted effect on public safety and organized crimes. Of course, uh, money from uh, trafficking of illegal drugs, it ends up in, in the wrong hands and fuels even more crime. Kashan, Michel, do, do you agree with that? Is there a, a real deterrent effect of, of, well, uh, of drug policies? Well, I agree that law enforcement, uh, law enforcement brings results. The question is, are those the results we want? And, and I think this is, uh, this is where I would disagree uh, somehow. So, deterrence question. You know, it's really difficult to argue this point because if we had half of the world where drugs were legal and the other half of the world where drugs were illegal, we can compare the two. We can do a study, we can know what it is that we're talking about. We're not in this situation. So basically, whatever, whatever it is that people are trying to articulate, there's little data to support it one way or another. But there is some data and I think we should think about it. So let's look at Portugal a country that decriminalized personal possession of every single substance, not just cannabis, heroin, uh, amphetamine. And what do we see from there? The drug use, you know, people were not, did not go crazy and didn't say, whoa, it's now not illegal, so I'm going to start smoking. The reality is that if you compare Portugal to all the other countries in Europe, there is a trend of slight... Um, increase, but it's very consistent with all of the European countries. What's interesting is the youngest folks, kids between 13 and 16, for them, the drug use reduced. Less policing, in fact, the number of new drug users among the youngest went down. So I think this argument that we need police to deter people from drug use, I actually am not sure that it's that correct. Look at Holland. Right? Coffee shops in Holland. One would expect, again, thinking that police is what's needed to deter people, that the Dutch are continuously high on cannabis. Well, if you look at the data again, it's interesting because the number of Dutch users is lower than all of the neighboring countries. France, Belgium, Italy, Germany. So it doesn't seem that law enforcement is really necessary for people to make rational decisions. <coughs> you know, let's look at tobacco, right? We don't have to put anyone into prison to, start smo to stop smoking. There are public health interventions, there's taxation, there is a wide range of tools that we can use. None of them include policing. So again, I think, I mean, it's not to argue that there is no role for policing because I actually am a big fan of what happens in Switzerland and the policing in Switzerland. But I think this assumption is that police serves as a deterrent or that restrictive law serves as a deterrent. I think it's somehow untested. We are just assuming that this is the case. Uh, Balaj, HCLU did the study a couple of years ago where you compared European countries when you ask people why it is that they don't take drugs. And it turns out that it's for health reasons, it's for many reasons. It's not necessarily because drugs are illegal. It's interesting though, most of the people would say, no, it's not the police. But they also assume that the deterrent effect exists for others. So they are clever enough 
uh, they think they are clever enough to decide whether drugs are good or bad for them, and they don't need a police officer to say that this is a no, no, don't do it. But they do think about the others uh, that the deterrent effect exists. Uh, this, you know, brings us to the perception, the public perception, and 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 actual uh, realities. You know, the Netherlands, Kashi, both of the Netherlands. The Netherlands is is considered. Uh, the liberal uh, black sheep of the uh, international community in, in, in many sense. But Switzerland, which is really leading the way in, in harm reduction, isn't, uh, isn't considered at least a very liberal uh, country. And as far as I know, uh, human rights, tolerance, uh, and solidarity weren't the driving forces behind the Swiss harm reduction intervention. So what were they? I mean, what was the reason Switzerland uh, chose another path? Quite simply, uh, finding quick fixes and and solutions to problems which were all over the cities. I mean, Switzerland was quite badly hit by this heroin wave in the 1980s, beginning of the 1990s, and it just created uh, open drug scenes in in all major cities in Switzerland. Open drug scenes meaning places where addicts would gather around the clock uh, trying to buy uh, drugs, shooting up. And also around those drug scenes we had a, a big problem with petty crime and hygienic circumstances. So the Swiss drug policy actually only wanted to solve this, these problems. And I think human rights human rights ideas was not, in fact, the driving factor, I quite agree. Uh, I would agree with this. Uh, there, there was a, a very pragmatic approach somehow uh, in Switzerland. Uh, I now have been living in Geneva for five years and I see the Swiss as, as, as very pragmatic in general. But I'd like to say that in Switzerland the other you know, driving factor has been the awareness of the health crisis and, and, and HIV. Um, and. Uh, and so, to me, the, the, you know, the, the decisive, um, the, the turning point is when a society or a country will actually switch from considering drugs as criminal to considering this as a public and social, uh, a, a social and, and public health issue. Uh, and that has, to be, that has to be the starting point. Once you're there, if you then, from there, start moving budgets, from prohibition law enforcement to support health uh, interventions, then it's the beginning of a process. Drug policies, you know, will not change like this from one day to another. It isn't a, a Berlin Wall that, that, that will fall. It, it will be, uh, as any social change, a slow process. But if you look back, and that's my way of looking uh, sunny or positive here, um, <clears throat> if you look back, some countries started decriminalizing drugs in the actually in the end of the 70s and so and the number of countries that are you, uh, introducing harm reduction interventions the number of countries that have been decriminalizing two more states in the recent uh, referendum in the in the US uh, decriminalizing uh, cannabis all of that is uh, i think somewhere I want to think an irreversible um, movement. Michel, you are uh, a commissioner of the uh, Global Commission on, on, on Drug Policy, and it's a, uh, it's a very uh, uh, substantive initiative. Uh, I counted no less than, than eight former country leaders, former presidents and, and prime ministers, mayors, state secretaries. Uh, but I'm really sorry to put the emphasis on the former, on the word former, and, and don't take it personal, it's not about you uh, being the head of Global Fund, you've always been an advocate of harm reduction, but what is this thing with uh, politicians who, uh, who uh, are uh, behaving as, as either drug warriors, either uh, just, uh, just executors of the current system and then, then you know, leaving them to terms, turn to be reformists? Yes, well, I have to be uh, careful here, and I can't speak on behalf of, you know, the fellow commissioners, but you're absolutely right to say that this is a, a hugely powerful group. Let, let's recognize it. Um, there are, uh, as you said, about eight 
former heads of states from all over the world. That's in America, Europe, actually Central Europe as well, with former President Kwasniewski of, of, of Poland. You have people like Kofi Annan, Louis Arbor. You have a number of former ministers. I'm just the, the, the doctor on the, <laughs> on the group. Um, the, but what I heard, I heard very clearly President Cardozo of Brazil, uh, President Gavi, former President uh, uh, of Brazil, uh, former President Gaviria of, uh, of Colombia, uh, speak and, and former President Zedi of Mexico, tell us in, in the commission that it took them some time to realize. And when they were... So, but they now acknowledge and, and you know, they, they, they've really turned into, into real activists. Now, when you're actually in power, you're uh, accountable to your parliament, you're accountable to your, uh, to your people, and it's, it's extremely difficult to, <clears throat> to, to be in a position of, of an open advocate, particularly if the public opinion is, is not supporting you. So I can't really, you know, the, what I'm saying is that I have really heard these people talk about this, this something one day that we realized and changed the way we think. And they become, became hugely committed commissioners to the cause. Kasia, would you agree? Yeah, I, I agree that they're hugely com committed and I'm not on the commission, uh, but I can share with you my experience of uh, talk, talking President Kwasniewski into being on the commission. And, and for us, it was important because this is a president that in 2000 signed the drug law that we are still struggling with, uh, the drug law which uh, basically puts you to prison for any amount of any substance. So we now have roughly 400,000 people with criminal records in Poland as a result of that drug law that he signed in 2000. So we thought that it was really important to approach him and to see how he feels about the decision that he has taken then. And it was too one and a half hour conversations with a lot of data about basically showing the results. Listen, here is what happened. And, you know, it's interesting because it was clearly a process, but it was a relatively fast process. Once the data is there, it's difficult to argue with it. And, and I think President Cardoso says the same thing. You know, he says the same thing that he actually invited DEA, the law American law enforcement, into Brazil, and now he sees some results. So I think like any human being, you know, mistakes were made, quite serious ones, and people are trying to rectify. Yeah, just a quick word, because uh, we were talking about in, in incarceration, and, uh, um, and, and that came, the, uh, again, just in, in Kasha's words. What I missed in the film, and I would like everyone to be aware of, because today we talk about health, is that not only is it absurd to have these millions of people incarcerated for minor drug offenses, but prison has now become the, one of the, the, the places where you're at higher risk of actually acquiring HIV, hepatitis, or tuberculosis. Uh, I, w I came across a, a, an amazing figure uh, recently, in r the Russian Federation, if you're incarcerated, your risk as, as a, for, for a drug offense, your risk of acquiring tuberculosis is 25 times higher than in the general population. And, uh, and as you know, in Russia, this is even more frightening somehow and scary because a, a, a large fraction of the new cases of tuberculosis are so-called multi-resistant, multi-drug resistant <coughs> tuberculosis. I just wanted to uh, sort of bring that addition to the debate on, on prisons. Prisons are not a safe environment, is it? Uh, and Balaj, not all the presidents are apologizing because uh, uh, President Dreyfus is not apologizing <laughs> because she indeed, yes, she, she, she indeed is the person that stood behind drug policy at the time when she was in fact in the office. But I guess you know what I meant. Yes, President yes. Clinton did nothing basically 
when he was in charge. And today, his wording, what he used at the World AIDS Conference, is really heartwarming, inspiring, except now he's not the president anymore. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, you mentioned Russia, uh, uh, Michel, which in itself is a big chunk of the problem. Uh, Russia doesn't allow opiate substitution treatment. Methadone is prohibited in, in that country. Is there a Russian way of solving the problems, or the epidemic is, is uh, out of control? At this time, I feel very pessimistic, I mean, to, to be very frank. Um, yes, methadone is illegal, and I just don't <coughs> see any dialogue possible. And whenever you present the evidence that we've been talking about this afternoon to the Russian authorities, <coughs> The answer is, well, yes, okay, but uh, that doesn't mean that this would work in Russia, in our environment. Um, and, um, and a number of uh, pilot trials have been started, but the results of those are not acknowledged. I, I remember, you know, as, as the head of the Global Fund, we, um, following some of the work from um, uh, OSF, we, we funded a, a large number of NGOs at a relatively big scale to start programs of harm reduction, needle exchange particularly. And uh, after three years, that program called the Globus program uh, showed clear results of decreasing numbers of new HIV <coughs> infections in the provinces, the oblasts, where it was implemented. Um, and uh, when we had a, a high-level meeting with the Minister of Health to present her with these results. She came with the Russian results, saying we also know how to count. And according to her results, it's actually in the very oblasts where harm reduction was implemented that there was an inc uh, the fastest increase in infections. So it was just lying, just dishonest, uh, arrogant, uh, and if that is the debate today there, I just don't see any way out. So let's be uh, patient. This is an island somewhere in the world. And uh, one day it will give up, uh, I'm, I'm sure. I, I don't know when. Uh, meanwhile, we have to continue to patiently uh, talk about the evidence you know, talk as we do this afternoon, and also at one point try and put pressure on, on the top. I, I had a bit of a sunny sky <coughs> last year, we, I actually discussed it with, with George, when uh, the Russians, uh, the highest, uh, the, the, the Deputy Prime Minister, the Minister of Foreign Affairs and the Minister of Finance, Lavrov Kudrin, came together for two hours to, to talk about HIV and then Every, every sort of hope that could be raised disappeared the day after. So my answer is pessimism at this time. I see. Before uh, turning the floor to, you, uh, to taking questions, I have one question to you, uh, Roger. We haven't touched the, uh, the money side, the, uh, the, uh, the side of the economics, but when someone is reading the, uh, the Swiss results and the uh, first experimental and now mainstream ways of treating uh, drug addiction in, in Switzerland, it, it's really striking how much money it can be saved uh, with harm reduction uh, services and, 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 op and operations. Uh, I mean, aren't law enforcement representatives sorry for losing uh, some percentage of their funding, uh, which is actually coming because of the need of being tough on, 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 on drug users? Not, not at all. It's not an, all, an issue. I think, I mean, the burdens which are uh, put on the shoulders of police are quite numerous. And in many European countries, uh, drugs are no longer a priority for police work. You know, it's now more than a decade that a subject like terrorism came in, or hooliganism, or financial crimes. So many new priorities have pushed away drugs. So I feel that many of the investigating groups uh, lose personnel, lose support, lose also the support from the prosecutors. 
So no, they're not afraid of losing the job. And I mean, I, I make I must make clear that in Switzerland we didn't we didn't turn Switzerland into a heroin supermarket. Uh, it's I mean this was very uh, controlled. Uh, it was a small group of about 1,200 persons uh, getting access to heroin treatment. It was a very uh, controlled and closely supervised group of 18,000 persons getting access to a broad to a to a opioid maintenance uh, therapy. Um, and all other drug use apart was still is still regarded as as illegal and is is, is prosecuted. What what now? Um, what we do now in Switzerland is what we try to, to make um, the process of prosecution more effective. So instead of having a criminal procedure for everybody lighting up a joint, we would very much like to have a system uh, which just foresees for fines. So this is like an immediate punishment of, I don't know, um, 100 euros or around this. And then this is a close deal for, for the police and for law enforcement. So we are not losing our jobs. In fact, we still have quite a lot to do. And I, would, I really think it's important to stress this, that I don't think that uh, police justice will uh, uh, lose resources or jobs due to changes in drug policy. It's not the Swiss experiences, at least. Our goal was to make this uh, event as interactive as it is possible. So at this point, I would like to uh, uh, to ask you to uh, to pose questions. If you have any few basic rules, we would be very happy if you could introduce and identify yourself and pose any question. Qu priority would go to questions. If you have interventions, please try to limit it to uh, to two minutes, and we would take up two questions at the same time. We have two mics. Uh, there and, and, and there. So please, uh, the floor is yours. Hello, my name is Peter Sharshi. I work for the Hungarian Civil Liberties Union. <coughs> I have two questions. First is that Michel mentioned that uh, a few weeks ago in two states of the United States, marijuana was legalized. And uh, how do you see the impacts of, of these two uh, initiatives that passed? And especially the impacts on Latin America, which is now kind of rebelling against the American approach of drug policies. And a second, a second question is to Michel. Uh, the Global Fund played a very active role in promoting harm reduction in, in Eastern Europe and Central Asia. How do, you, how do you feel about the appointment of the new director? Do you think it will uh, change the, the role the Global Fund plays in the region? Thank you. Yeah, but we, I don't see anyone in the moment, so please. Okay, so, so what are the implications for, for cannabis? Well, one thing to keep in mind is, I, uh, Peter, I don't think they legalized. They voted to legalize. So I think when it actually happens is, is a matter for further discussion. Uh, so just so everyone knows, along with the presidential, uh, during the presidential elections, two, country, two states voted for uh, legalization of cannabis. Now, what are the implications? The first one and my favorite one is the international one, which is it's extremely difficult for the US to carry the torch of prohibition when its own people spoken in two states that they don't want the prohibition. And I think this is what Latin Americans are now pointing out. Uh, Mexico is clearly saying that they have to rethink their approach in the light of the referendums. There were many other countries that basically said, well, don't send your DEA agents to my country if you can't deal with your own drug problem and you need to now figure out how to regulate. So I think that this really sort of undermined the US position of, of the prohibitionists. Now, what other implications it will have? You know, I actually think that I mean, my hope is that there is not a long, drawn-out battle that will end at the Supreme Court, because I think the bottom line is we already have seen this in the U.S. with medical <coughs> cannabis. It started with two states, moved on to three, five, we now have 19. So my hope is that basically we'll follow that model, that in the next two years we're going to have another two states. In the next two years we're going to have another two states. 
and so that the process has begun. Um, so th those would be my sort of my two quick thoughts. Yeah, um, you know the uh, the strategic de decisions uh, in the global fund around where and how will you spend the, the large amounts of money that the fund is, is spending in fighting AIDS come from the board, not from the executive director. I was sort of lucky to have a board that, you know, let me work. What I'm saying now is that in times of financial and economic constraints, at a time where a number of development agencies represented on the board consider that the so-called high-impact countries for interventions are the poorest countries of the world with the highest burden epidemic, rather than some of the transitioning countries with concentrated epidemics. Uh, the, the ball somehow is, is, with the, um, is with the board. And, and so my answer to your question would be, let us strengthen the board of the Global Fund. Let us mobilize that board. You are represented and your constituencies are represented on that board and have to speak out, be very careful and make sure that the investments continue as they are needed uh, in, in the Eastern European and, and Central Asian uh, region. And they're particularly needed because it will take, as we've been discussing uh, for Russia, a long time before these countries will actually come with investments from their national budgets to cover the public health needs. From the School of Public Policy. Um, I have two questions, first for the panelists and the second for the moderator. Um, the first one is what were the arguments that allowed to shift the public opinion and the public policy in Switzerland, for instance, and how translatable are this to different contexts? And then, because we are in Budapest, what's the situation in Hungary and what can you aim for realistically in the immediate or medium term future? <coughs> um, Christoph Varga from the CEO of Liaison Office. I'd like to piggyback on Bolaj's uh, Mars parallel a, a bit, and let's imagine that we are conquering Mars. So it's a clean slate, and a new uh, human civilization is being built. Would you be against? legalizing all drugs under those circumstances? And if yes, why? Thank you. So who starts? <laughs> Maybe I will start with the first, first question. <laughs> why? Why? This is, this why? is easier for me. <laughs> um, you know, the policy change in, in Switzerland occurred at the time when I was too young, I mean, to witness it personally. <coughs> But uh, as far as I understand, um, the drug problem was like the number one issue in the public debate in Switzerland. It was very prominent. It affected uh, public safety and public health. And so there was a, a, an underlying attitude for change um, in Switzerland uh, in, the, in the end of the 1980s. Um, when you go back and look at the single steps which were taken, I have to admit that it was not the police who made the first steps. It was courageous uh, doctors and social workers who started programs of needle distribution, doctors who started with methadone treatment, and also um, a University of Zurich, I think it was, starting uh, with uh, a trial, a research program on, on heroin-assisted treatment. So it was um, single subjects, and municipalities who in fact started to change and then uh, the federal government just uh, going after it once they had the good evidence and I think it's it's not such an exception it's not exceptional that in Switzerland it worked like this you often have first and important steps taken at the local level or taken by some specialists and then once the evidence is good enough 
uh, governments following suit. We had a second question. <laughs> <laughs> well, quite, quite frankly, for me, you know, it's not about, the question is not about legalizing substances or prohibition. Um, I think what I still try to do as a, as a member of police is to find practical solutions that suit to everybody. I've, I don't, I, I see with many substances, I see a problem in legalizing them from a medical point of view. Um, and also I don't see much room from, from, from politics, but I think that we, we really need to readjust our priorities. We need to, to keep in mind what were the basic principles of, you know, the, of the, the international control system, the basic principles or the ideas behind, the idea behind the international control system was not to lock up people or to punish them. The, the good we are trying to protect here is the, the health of the individual and the general public. And once you remember uh, the general principle behind the, the international control system, I think you automatically jump to the conclusion that, yes, prohibition, there is a way prohibition can work, but only if you have the top priority at the same time on harm reduction, making sure that people have access to the treatment they need, that, that users have a place where they can use the drugs, if users have access to clean needles, I think. That must be the first priority. Um, sorry to uh, in interrupt you, Roger, but isn't, this, uh, 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 isn't there a con contradiction? What you're saying that can harm reduction services work in a prohibited environment? Prohibition means that we are actually aiming to put people behind bars because of drug use. How can you expect from those people uh, to appear around the harm reduction services. I mean, we, we have this we have this situation on a daily on a daily basis in Switzerland. We have the consumption rooms. We have at, at techno dance parties. We have uh, laboratories where users can go and have the drugs tested. And the police know about this. And of course, if we turn up in front of those facilities and carry out controls systemat systematically, nobody. Will, will go to the social counselling, nobody will go to the uh, con consumption room or the, to have the drugs checked at the party. So we, we strike a deal with the social workers. They inform us beforehand. We restrain from carrying out controls. But at the same time, if we learn about people taking advantage of this, if people start you, uh, selling drugs in front of a of a drug check program or at the consumption sites, it's often the social workers who call the police that they come and and uh, and deal with the situation. So, I think prohibition. There is a way that prohibition can work, but only if social workers, public health officials, and uh, uh, police officers are working together quite closely and on a regular basis. Question, Michel. Michel, you go. Well, if, if, if we enter the, that new planet, uh, before uh, thinking of what sort of policy you would wish there and w what it is that you would wish to be legal or illegal, you will ask yourself the questions, why are you actually putting forward policies and, and laws? And uh, what you know, I'm saying is that when it comes to drugs, we need to shift from a criminal and legal perspective and, and law enforcement perspective to a health and social perspective. So that has to be the driving force behind the policies. So if it was just a matter of whether you should legalize or, or whether you, your drugs should be illegal, uh, to me it's not the issue. The, the issue, as, as Roger just said is what it is that you want at the end. You want a society with people that are healthy, you want less crime, you want people to develop in, in safe communities and in safe environments. And the evidence that we have at this time 
is that this starts with this public health and social approaches to the issues rather than being solved just by law. It, you, you cannot impose by law to someone to be healthy. Or, so, um, so, to me, the, the, the problem can't just be asked, the question can't be asked in the way you put it. Sorry to escape somehow the, uh, the problem, but I, I, you know, you have to ask your question the question of why is it that you need a law and why is it that you need a policy. Okay, so here's how I would, here's what I would uh, offer. I think that the planet X should regulate all substances. And the more dangerous the substance, the more regulated it should be. So if we're talking about heroin, maybe the way to regulate it is through what Switzerland has done. People who are heavily addicted have regulated access in medical facilities. Because I think the problem that we have now is we assume that not regulating makes it more, uh, less available. Well, I think it's exactly the opposite. The more I'm worried about the, how dangerous the substance is, the more regulation it should require. But it should be available to those that make a conscious choice. Adult, grown-ups make a conscious choice. They want to use it. Now, this is for that other planet. For our planet Earth, I think regulating everything right now or legalizing is not possible. And I think it's not possible for many reasons. One of them is the, ex the out-of-control drug market, which I think will be... It it'll take a long time to, in fact, try to find a way to, uh, to regulate. Uh, but if we were starting from zero, I would say heavily regulate the more, the most uh, dangerous substances uh, and then play with regulation around others. Yes, but uh, um, however, with the you know, synthetic drugs and new drugs and homemade drugs coming every day, you, you can't have a list of things that would be updated to regulate. Uh, right. So, so I, I, I would follow you very much, but let's say all of this is, is irrealistic. Even on planet X, uh, homemade drugs and, and synthetic drugs will, will also come. So let's focus on reducing harm. Uh, or, uh Topic tonight is really not Hungary, but uh, I can answer very shortly and bring three examples, and, and that will tell you where are we now and where are we uh, heading. The, uh, Hungary, I believe, is the only country in the European Union which currently lacks uh, uh, a national drug strategy. Uh, more than two years ago, the uh, strategy was, was removed, uh, and the government decided to v v vote a new one. That still didn't happen. So for two years without we are without uh, a national action plan and drug strategy. That's, that's one thing. A few years ago, uh, 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 there was a study which proved that the country spends about 40 million USD per year on law enforcement related cost of, uh, uh, of the drug issue. That means persecuting uh, uh, drug users. Most, most of the procedures are started against uh, small scale users of, of cannabis. At the same time, this study proved that uh, the amount of money spent on <clears throat> harm reduction, prevention, treatment, and rehabilitation is about four million altogether. Now, this amount, I believe, is now two million USD. And at the same time, I don't have really a reason to think that amount, uh, cost of law enforcement related procedures uh, are seriously reduced. So that's uh, that's the second thing. And the third thing is that even if the future and the situation is not bright, it will look and can look bright uh, because the current uh, topic we are, uh, uh, we are dealing with, and that's a scandal among the professional circles uh, in Hungary, uh, that the uh, drug report, the national drug report, what we, the country about to send to the European Union's European Monitoring Center on Drugs and Drug Addiction, uh, was actually censored. The uh, draft version of the report which was sent to the professional community is different 
uh, than the actual uh, report which was sent to the EU agency. Important pages are missing from that report, including parts uh, which deals with the hepatitis C uh, uh, epidemic among intravenous drug users, uh, among the uh, about the problems of the, uh, the, the so-called new uh, designer drugs. So even if the, uh, the uh, situation is not good, it, uh, it can look good. And that's where we are at the moment. And I have uh, no reason to think that this uh, picture will change dramatically in the future. <laughs> Let's go back to, uh, to our topic. Do, uh, do we have questions from the floor? Yes, welcome. Welcome to the School of Public Policy. With the evidence base at hand and with the prospective cost savings, can each of you give us, and including you, Balaj, can each of you give, give us some of the reason, and they, marry, they, they may well differ uh, across different countries, how do you explain the different positions between former members, former politicians, former heads of states on the commission, and acting politicians? What are the political pressures, what are the forces, what are the fears of politicians standing up and, and you know, exposing this problem and saying, I'm, I'm prepared to make a change. Because from what I understand, you're saying the evidence would change relatively quickly. So it cannot be fear of, of not being reelected on such an issue. You could, relati in a relatively short period of time, demonstrate that these elements and these policies would have a positive effect. What, from your experience, explains the stark difference between former retired politicians and active politicians? <laughs> Can we have a mic to uh, the first row, please? My name is Victor Oshatisk. I'm professor here. I will have a question, but I would uh, very be very happy to give the mic to any student that would want to ask a question. Here. Is no. any student here? Then I will talk by default. I have two questions. One question is to primarily to Michelle. It's about. Russia, actually Russia and Switzerland. I would love that Switzerland occupied Russia, uh, but I think uh, I think you know you have the Papal Papala Guard, you know, which is efficient. But isn't that primarily the difference between moralistic and pragmatic cultures? And if you know, why well, go often to Russia on alcohol treatment, and I see that the groups and people that are more effective and efficient are small Protestant communities because they are more pragmatic than orthodox moralistic culture. And, uh, and of course in moralistic culture, uh, not only there, but everywhere, I guess that former politicians don't have to fight for votes. And they believe that they may lose votes when they are in, 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 in office by uh, wanting to change the drug policy. My second question is to Roger. I disagree with you that this uh, entire drug policy is irrational. It's extremely rational and logical. It gives profits to so many people. It controls so many things. And three are related to police everywhere. Number one, that it gives incredible discretionary power to policemen <coughs> on the spot. He can prosecute one person, not another person. And police in many countries likes that a lot. Second is statistics. Police are made accountable on solving crimes. And the crime of the drug possession is the only crime under the earth which is solved by definition because there is no crime before it is solved. So if police anywhere wants to repair, repair and increase its statistics, they want desperately to criminalize drug possession because that makes their life easier and many effective. And finally, how about the, the the money, what did you in Switzerland? Because in the US, other countries, the money for drug problems, which is rational, logical, went from the health and prevention into police and law enforcement. And that's really increased and multiplied by great fraction. And the final thing, controlling the underclass. Drug laws are the best possible to control the underclass. And prisons and the prohibited laws everywhere are helping them. How did you deal? How did you went out of that trap? For police and law enforcement in Switzerland, that would be a lesson for others. Thank you. Um, let me start on the first question. Um, let, let's not forget that in Switzerland, you know, we've, we've been talking about the remarkable leader, Ruth Refus, 
But this is not the country where the president just decides things uh, on, on his own or on her own. The process in Switzerland has been a, a, an extre a, a process over months where the evidence that Roger men mentioned previously was actually presented to the population. Things were explained patiently and then the people voted. Uh, what uh, I would feel that is that at this time uh, leaders in, in other countries in Europe in a climate of tension linked to the economic and financial crisis, to communitarism, to more homophobia, xenophobia, uh, fear of uh, uncertainty in that climate, uh, I don't feel the acting politicians are ready to open uh, a, a, a serene democratic debate as the debate, uh, presenting the evidence, debating on the evidence, and, and then having the people democratically decide. Uh, they, they don't want to take that risk. I'm, I'm just thinking, for example, of my own country, France, where we had sort of great hopes uh, with the election of President Hollande. Uh, and as soon as two ministers of his government, within two months of, of the new administration, started the debate, um, they were asked to sort of shut off. And, uh, um, so that's, that would be my answer. Let's not forget that in, in Switzerland, it's been a very patient, uh, informed, democratic debate. And, and Victor, <coughs> this maybe is also what I would sort of answer to you. I agree on how you define the dichotomy between uh, Switzerland and Russia, but I would add that it's also between democracy and non-democracy. Uh, and, and in Russia is a country where currently you just cannot democratically challenge what the power will say, um, even with, with an evidence base uh, to, 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 to challenge those decisions. Therefore, you cannot open that democratic debate. And, and I'll just end by saying that I think the lesson from Switzerland and from Portugal is that um, you, you, you can't just say, change the situation with a, a decree again uh, or, or, uh, or uh, one, one simple decision. Uh, it, is, it is a progressive change that has to be um, really have the endorsement of the, of the population in a democratic environment. That's why it's so difficult. So a couple of thoughts. One of them, I just want to make sure that we did not leave an impression that it's only the former that are engaging. Because I, I have a printout here uh, of, of a report from um, uh, Iberio, uh, Iberio American Summit that just took place in Cadiz in Spain where we read current governments, right? Current presidents. Um, other key agreements that came out of the summit include an agreement by all members to push for a special UN General Assembly session no later than 2015 to discuss the international drug problem. So it's a different way of speaking, obviously, uh, but these are, these are presidents of Latin America plus Spain and Portugal that are also in some way revolting against the UN. I think that debate is going to look differently, uh, but I think um, it's important to know that we now have sitting presidents who are speaking against it. So if you look at President uh, Molina from Guatemala, He's talking about everything, including legalization. If you look at President Santos, Santos uh, from Colombia, again, he is talking about starting a real debate. He, I, the Colombian government is actually putting money into a process that will be uh, Latin America. The outgoing president of Mexico, uh, uh, he's leaving, so I already forgot his name. <laughs> uh, president... Oh my God, President of Mexico. 
Calderon, <laughs> exactly. President Calderon, outgoing, but also, you know, not terribly impressively and bravely, but does say, you know, maybe it didn't work. Think about uh, what's next. So I guess I just don't want to make sure that we don't give an impression that it's only the former presidents. But I think the important question in this context is what happens in Latin America, in fact, that allows for those statements. And I think what happens in Latin America is really a true feeling that people are fed up with a drug policy that has been imported, uh, exported by the U.S. and it, in fact is doing actual damage to the countries. And I think the debate, in fact, it's clear that there's a lot of civil society uh, and uh, an academic uh, expression that what's happening now is just not acceptable. So, uh, so, so I think these are the two somewhat important uh, spaces that have been created for those leaders to actually say those things. And I think, uh, and I think that's actually quite important. Um, something else I want to it, it escape. Okay. Basically, you're saying Catholic Latin America is joining the pragmatic Protestant part of the drug reformists. But let's hear the, uh, the oh, pragmatic protest. In, sorry, in, in response just to Victor, I actually think that Switzerland, Russia, for all of those reasons that uh, Michelle outlined, complicated to analyze, but Poland's Czech Republic, you know, talk about moralistic versus pragmatic. So, so I, I think that, you know, we're super Catholic, they're not, look at our drug policy, look at their drug policy. Uh, so, so I think that that's an important... Uh, philosophical view that plays into how we implement policy. I, I would like to start with the remark that I think uh, relig religious backgrounds don't influence drug policies too much. I mean, Switzerland is a, is a mixed country, half Catholic, half Protestant, and you have all the, the cantons with the predominant religion. And I don't see that Protestant... Uh, cities are necessarily more progressive than Catholic ones. It's just, it's really, it's a higgledy-piggledy. Catholic pragmatics also. <laughs> <laughs> right. Because they are Swiss. But, but we know the weight of the Russian Orthodox Church too, actually. Um, so, uh, coming back to the questions, I mean, although it's a bit far away from my daily work, I would like to make a comment on on uh, attitudes of politicians in power or leading office. Um, I think for me one simple reason is that uh, why drug policy changes are such a hot iron for people in power is that you are very, really running the risk to fall victim of a political campaign or a media campaign uh, once you, you stop prosecuting drug phenomenon. Um, I would like to make an example. There was this mysterious case, I think, um, in this summer, when a man attacked a fellow man and started uh, biting him. And the media coverage went <coughs> in the direction that, in fact, this man was under the influence of bath salts, so one of the research chemicals uh, being around. Um, we started getting those questions by medias um, and I mean the story was the same actually for more or less every journalist who, who called. It was, well we have this case in the United States, a man ate his fellow man uh, in the, under the influence of bath salts, now what are you doing about it? So that was the question and if you say well <laughs> nothing because we don't know about it or we don't know what substance was uh, involved or whether the man was under the influence of anything at all. It's, it's difficult to, s to sell this news. People won't listen to it. They want a clear answer to it. And it's always easy to provide simple answers. Second question was a bit trickier for me. Um, whether Switzerland would invade Russia. It would be definitely an example of imperial overstretching, I think. Uh, <laughs> And uh, now about, I mean, the law enforcement uh, uh, ha having a profit from the war on drugs. Um, I mean, I, I agree with, with some of the things you said. Like, statistics is very, is very persuading. You make an arrest, 
uh, you have a criminal procedure, you have a judgment, and it gives a nice statistics, uh, statistics at the end of the year. And quite frankly, that's usually what happens if you have a, an international law enforcement gathering when it comes to drugs. We compare statistics and it all looks very nice. Um, but I don't think that um, police work is so much uh, subjugated to statistics in all the countries. I, I don't think so. In Switzerland, it doesn't, at least it doesn't play such a big role. Seizures and, and convictions are not vital. Uh, I think we are more measured, um, for example, in regard, do we provide for public safety or not? Mm. Discretionary power was another thing you mentioned. It's really, it's a very ticklish subject. Um, practical example, you make an arrest, you stop somebody who is using a substance, maybe not cannabis, maybe he is uh, snorting cocaine. Um, this is a, a, a simple situation that police officers have day and day again. If it's a person you have been arresting for 20 times, you maybe are more likely to think, well, let's not lose time with this again and let him go. If it's a young person you meet for the first time, you're probably more likely to really make a confiscation and make sure uh, that the authorities are alarmed about this case because there might be, as a punishment, some sort of social counselling going on, at, at least in Switzerland. I mean, this is a, a, an example of, of a discretionary power and sometimes it's very useful, it makes police work easier, but, of, but at, at the same time you have situations where corruption is more widespread, where this can bring along problems. Uh, I agree that for, for many for many countries, maybe also for Switzerland, it would be more fair and a better idea to have, you know, one offence and the same uh, punishment for everybody. It, but I think, for me, it's not, it's not um, a point where I think that police are very, very convinced about or very fond of this discretionary power. I have seen um, policemen openly speaking against it because it brings them into the situation where they have to decide whether this is a problematic drug user or somebody where we can uh, that you, you can let go. It's really it's it's a, it's a it's a difficult situation you find yourself in. Yes, sure. <coughs> I, I should like to comment on uh, Victor's question because it's very interesting listening to a Swiss policeman answering it. If you asked uh, uh, an American policeman, the answer would be different because the situation in the United States is very different. Uh, you have, for instance, uh, uh, confiscation of uh, drug uh, um, uh, arrests, uh, uh, which actually uh, go directly to the police. Hmm? Cars, houses, uh, cars, houses, and so on. Uh, I have uh, uh, attended a, a court in New, New Orleans, which basically lives on the income it gets uh, by fining uh, drug offenders. So I think it would be very interesting for you to go to the United States and make a study, <laughs> and, and then you, <laughs> you would have a really interesting insight into why the United States uh, follows the policies that it does. And of course, uh, uh, it's a well-known uh, fact that, for instance, in, in California, the, uh, the um, uh, police, uh, the uh, uh, prison wardens union is the largest political force in California. Uh, so uh, the, the, the situation in the United States is very different from Switzerland. And that therein lies, I think, the explanation, a large part of the explanation, because there are all sorts of other issues, uh, uh, race, race, ra racial 
uh, considerations which are very important in, in America and probably less so in Switzerland. But that's, that's a large part of the explanation of why Switzerland has a, a, a what I would call, uh, call a more enlightened uh, policy than the United States. If you permit, I would also like to, to comment on the last point you, Victor, made um, regarding minorities and on, 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 the, on the class. Um, I, I quite agree that, you know, there might have been some influence of an overarching aim to, to subjugate minorities or classes in, in some countries in the past. But I find it difficult for me now, speaking in 2012, <coughs> where drug use is so widespread that you can find it uh, on all social levels with, with bankers, with students, with house as virtually everybody. Uh, I, I cannot think that, at least in, 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 in European countries, that you really single out this policy to go after a distinctive minority or class. 95% arrested are from lower classes, and 5% are from upper classes, and they all snore the same. This I, is absolutely I, a statistic, perhaps not in Switzerland, but statistic is rampant about class bias of the, of the drug law. But, but is it, is it, is it <coughs> class, you know, of, of the people before they started using drugs? I mean, in the end, you start policing but the people, the person who, who are in the streets, and of course the persons who are homeless in the streets, they have not. They have no income often. So that those are the, the people you focus on because politics tell you to. Because you have to look for public order and safety. So that's that's you are ordered to this point to carry out arrests to to, 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 to produce a visible that's result. What I'm saying. Yeah. But I think it's not it's not class bias. You know, it's just it's a it's a pragmatical solution of a local problem to to bring relief to a neighborhood. Which is class bias. Which is class bias. <laughs> but you know, it's, it's probably, what if the it's... The husband it's, of my daughter worked as a bartender in the club for highest elite, you know. All of them were snoring. It was in Warsaw in 1990s. All of them. Police never came there. Not even once. And on the corner, where the people from lowest classes were doing much less dangerous things because uh, they were just uh, smoking marijuana, they were there because it was easier and because these are them. These are them. And this is us. These are high level people. They make money for, for, for transition, for all this shit, you know. But these this guys are them. And then we come to populists. Populists say us and them and fear them and we will save you. It, Victor, in, in my experience... It's not Switzerland, I know, but Switzerland, no, I ask you guys, how I did know, you evade, evade, avoid it, all this I, I crap know, in Switzerland? That was, you I answered know. my question very well, I want to go to Switzerland. I know. <laughs> no, I, I, I personally know these situations, that's why I would like to try to explain that I think it's not a class bias driving police forces to do their work, you know. For example, in, in, in most of the cities in Europe, I would say, the drop problem is, viral, is, is visible in poor areas. So what we actually do, we, we are policing there in order to relieve the local poor underclass neighborhood of the drug problem. So th 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 this is not, I mean, for me this is, this is not biased. And as for the other things... The result is biased. <laughs> as for the other thing, you know, going into a club and carry out searches, you can do that as, as a police force, but I mean, you you enter a building which is dark, where you find three or four hundred persons dancing, drinking, using. The minute you enter the club, I mean, the the, the drugs go higgle the piggledy. You find you find them on the floor, and you can't prove possession to anybody in the club. That's why it's really difficult to 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 carry out such a search in a in a closed dark confined space at night. It's really, I mean, it's a practical if, difficulty you have as a police officer. If you are a Swiss police officer, if you are a Hungarian police officer, you force all the 400 to your intent, right? <laughs> and then it's, then it's easy. Uh, I'm afraid we, uh, we are close to the end, end of the session, but I would like to give the floor to Kasia and, 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 and Michel. And yeah, I just wanted to, to come back on the, <laughs> bring back the debate to the health issues and what George said uh, around the racial bias should not be underestimated because in the US, 
the, the bias that is the highest risk for someone who is an Afro-American to be arrested for a minor drug offense is such uh, that given uh, the risks I've been discussing before of acquiring HIV in prison, that bias in, in arrests is considered now as one of the causes why the HIV epidemic is predominant among Afro-Americans in, in the US. So uh, that is a very, these biases are, are very big issues. Um, and of course, the, I also wanted to add that, you know, we moved from the US to Switzerland, and if we go to Russia there, of course, for the policemen, fining is also, you know, a good way. Uh, there's a lot of bribery and corruption. So I, would, I, I was going to say that I would really love all of us to support Russian policemen if they were one day to demonstrate in the street for higher salaries. Okay, so I, um, I guess my parting comment <laughs> would be uh, that I think there is a space for police, for smart policing, uh, and we've seen that in some communities, and actually it's been quite impressive. I think a part of the problem that we have is the other side of it, which is, you know, police officers standing outside of a methadone program in China, and people wondering why is there no uptake. So, so I think I think that discussion needs to needs to happen, and I do think that academia is extremely important to this discussion. So, uh, Wolfgang, I actually hope that a couple of years from now will be answering the question you asked by some policy data that has been generated at CMU. Because I think one of the reasons why it's hard to answer that question is because there's actually very little academic knowledge in the area of drugs policy. And, and I think it's really great to be here and it's great to have uh, George welcome us here. Um, and I think this, this sort of the spirit of this conversation will continue at CMU. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, that was about it. Uh, please uh, watch out uh, uh, for the next two events. Uh, they will be advertised on the website of the School of Public Policy. And thank you very much for your attention and, and presence. We uh, prepared a small reception outside. Please enjoy everything, including the uh, refreshments. Uh, some of them are legal drugs. So thank you so much. <laughs>